Hello and let's talk about Safura Zargar getting bail and the cases regarding the riots in Delhi. The 27-year-old activist who is 23 weeks pregnant was arrested on April 10th and is charged under the Draconian Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. The police claimed that she was involved in a conspiracy that led to the riots in Delhi in February in which 53 people were killed. Zargar is a member of the Jamia Coordination Committee which was in the forefront of organising protests against the CAA, NRC and NPR. She was denied bail three times earlier. Safura's case is only one of the many that point to a larger web that is being weaved by the Delhi police in connection with the riots. There is the case of Natasha Narwal and Devangana Kalita of the group Pinjara Thod, who have also been booked under the UAPA. Earlier, there was a report of police claiming that the student activist Omar Khalid was involved in a meeting to cause trouble during Donald Trump's visit to Delhi. Incidentally, this so-called meeting took place much before there was any news of Trump visiting Delhi itself. And now, reports have emerged that prominent activists such as Harsh Mandir and Yogendra Yada were also named in the charge sheets related to the violence. Thus, according to the Delhi police, a number of activists who called for peaceful protests and others involved in those protests, many of whom were Muslims, were all in some way involved in the riots in which the majority of those affected were also Muslims. And as for BJP leaders like Kapil Mishra who were on record making provocative speeches, there is well silence. We spoke to journalist Bhasha Singh on the bail in the various cases that are filed in connection with the riots. Here's what she had to say. Thank you, Bhasha, for joining us. So we saw yesterday that uh, Safura Zargar was given bail. Uh, the court was very clear that this was not a precedent. It was not be treated as a precedent. It was purely on humanitarian grounds. And over the past few days, we've seen news about a lot of others being implicated in this case. Now, this includes prominent activists, this includes people with links to political organizations. So we see that a very wide web is uh, being created, for lack of better words. So how do you evaluate what has been happening over the past few days? Uh, thank you, uh, Prashant. And uh, what I feel that yesterday, the way uh, Safura Zargar, who was uh, part of Jamia Coordination Committee, which was leading a very important movement in India that was uh, against the New Citizenship Amendment Act. Uh, she was arrested and yesterday she was uh, given the bail. And there was a huge uh, movement, persuasion to give her bail, uh, release her on bail because she was, uh, as we know that she's pregnant, and with a complication, she has a pregnancy. And that's why uh, if you see how the court has uh, come out, that uh, it is uh, just on the humanitarian ground. So that also they made very clear that the rest of the people who have been arrested, uh, be it uh, the woman activist uh, of the Pinjara Thor, be it Natasha or Devyanga, and many more. We have seen Miran Haider, whoever was the face of anti-CEA protest, anti-citizenship amendment act protest. Uh, finally, they have been framed and uh, taken to custody uh, with the connection with the uh, communal violence which happened in Delhi. So, and the list is very long. Uh, I, so far, also we don't know who all are going to be involved into it because it's a daily evolving thing. If you see that it's a very strange process which is happening across us and that's also happening in the national capital. That uh, now you have uh, Yogen Yadav uh, who is uh, a well-known uh, face in the political circle and academic and uh, leading a um, uh, political party who has been uh, contesting the elections also. And he was very vocal and his all his speeches during this movement uh, which uh, started in uh, national capital in the end of uh, 2019. So uh, you have uh, Yogen Yadav, he has been implicated, his name is there. Uh, we have Harsh Mandar's name is there, uh, who is also a well-known peace uh, activist and who has been working uh, on a lot of issues uh, along with the communal harmony, peace and all that. So what we find that there is a larger design which is taking place and the epic center of that design is national capital itself. It's, it's different from the Bhima Koregao thing, which we have seen before, where an uh, incident happened in uh, Maharashtra. And then the web has spread across the country. And we find that those who are directly connected or not connected, be it Gautam Nolaka, be it Anantel Tumde, all those who are very known face in the civil society, in the academia, 
have been implicated. But this time, what is the design, uh, and which is a very dangerous sign for all of us, is that now for this communal violence, those uh, who were involved directly, whose videos are there, whose speeches are there, be it Kapil Mishra, who is uh, a very well-known uh, face of uh, BJP in uh, Delhi, his speech is on record, his tweeters, uh, tweet, uh, tweets are on record, and uh, the way he was uh, moving around the national capital and uh, raising the slogan, Goli Maro Salon Ko, Desh Ke Gaddaron Ko, that means that you shoot all the people who are traitors, uh, and his speech at the Zafrabad the police station and the whole uh, uh, place is all is all on record. But so far we don't find that all these names or all those names uh, who were uh, very much uh, in the public domain, they are not even included in the charge sheet. They are not a part of uh, the legal process which the Delhi police at least for the sake of you know, doing something justice or some, uh, you can say that to uh, pretend that they are neutral, they should have done. But we find the entirely other way that those who are working for the relief work also, be it Yogendra, be it Harshmandar. As a journalist, I uh, went to all these places where uh, the Delhi was burned and it was a design, it was a designed attack. It was not as uh, all of a sudden it happened. And as we know, uh, national capital lost 53 Indian citizens in this violence and majority are Muslims, majority are Muslims. This whole area is minority dominated area where the violence happened. And what we find that now what the Delhi police and the administration is coming out, the home ministry is coming out, that basically it was Muslims who killed themselves. If you go through the whole logic which is being built uh, behind this charge sheet, if you read, it's a very lengthy charge sheet, but if you read it, the whole uh, design which is coming out that it was basically the Muslims who themselves thought to kill themselves, burn their properties, because that's how it is being uh, whole framed. And it has been linked to the anti-CA protest, anti-citizenship uh, amendment act protest, where there is no link so far. Uh, if you, uh, because you also uh, live in Delhi and uh, you must be hearing in the whole movement and many people were going as a journalist also reporting there. So at that time, there was no link. Basically, these were the people who were trying to make a peace, to make a relief, uh, to distribute the food, distribute the clothes. And now what you find that from Safura Zagar to Miran Haider to uh, Natasha, and the list is very long. All those people who were uh, initially raising their legitimate voice, constitutional voice against one uh, act, of the central government, they have been finally framed and now there is a whole process of taking a revenge. The state is taking a revenge from those people who are raising their voice. Majority who have been framed are Muslims, uh, be it activists like uh, Safura Zargar, who was a very uh, well-known face of the uh, Jamia Millia movement, because as we know that the whole movement of the Shaheen Bagh started when the Jamia, uh, there was an attack uh, on the Jamia uh, students by the police. Then uh, the Shaheen Bagh uh, women who just live nearby to the uh, Jamia University, they came, uh, they, they came out to protect their children who were studying there. So this is the whole chronology. I am just explaining in detail because it's very necessary to repeat again and again what happened and how the state is now presenting the whole case in the other way. Right. So that's a very uh, dangerous precedence and I think that the way they have uh, just pinpointed to some of the very known uh, civil society persons like Yogin or Harsh uh, and uh, they are saying that many more are there. It's, it's, it's still not closed. It's an right. open thing. And if you find that initially the charge sheet, these names were not there. The initial charge sheet, these names were not there. And this other plus others, 17 plus. Uh, so this is a very, uh, you can say that the later thought when they uh, thought that it looks like we can't say anything because we are not an investigative uh, agency. We can just uh, say and report from outside what uh, the apprehensions are. But the apprehensions are very clear because the moment, the way it is going on, the way they have implicated Hirsch and there was a huge, I read the whole charge sheet, in that it is being said 
And many of the journalists were there when Harsh was speaking at the Jamia Gate. I was there. And at that time also, he was saying that there's a need of peace. He was talking about Mahatma Gandhi and uh, all the things that we uh, have to uh, build up the movement and the people have to come on the street. But you see the way it has been twisted and turned. And now we find that uh, for the killing of a Delhi constable, all these uh, names are there. So which is very uh, weird that uh, how these, uh, this case is being built. At least a little relief is there that Safura is out. But the way uh, even the judiciary is coming out with their comments and initially also when uh, uh, it was said in the court about the Safura that she was not directly involved, she was just in the Jamia. Then the way the observation of the judge has come that if you play with the fire, then if you are own burned. Then... So this whole is a narrative, is a set narrative in which uh, this whole case is going and I think it is testing of the waters this uh, Indian intelligence uh, and the uh, Delhi police is doing the same way they have done with the Bhima Koregaon because I find a huge similarity between uh, both cases uh, the way it was designed and later the names were added and the names of the people who have never gone to even Bhima Koregaon who were not even the supporters of Bhima Koregaon uh, incident where there is a Dalit upsurge of identity uh, because I had a personal talk with Anand Tail Tumre also before and he was saying that he has, uh, he has a strong reservation about the whole movement of the Bhima Koregaon and irony is that now when we are talking Anand Tail Tumre is inside uh, bars, he is in jail for the same case, same for the Gautam Nolakha. So uh, same way we find that uh, Yogendra beats Yogendra Yadav beat Harshmandar all who have been always talking about the constitutional ways of movement, of peace, of uh, relief. Now they have been uh, booked, uh, they have been, their name has come uh, for the uh, killing of uh, one. And there's a uh, Sikh activist also. I met him at the Shaheen Bagh. We have so many stories for him. He uh, sold his flat just to keep the langar to uh, feed the uh, people in the Shaheen Bagh, the women who were protesting. So the, this I find that there's a, this design is, uh, we have to question this design, right. basically the way it is moving because this is, uh, the design is to crush the civil society voice of dissent in national capital because now Indian state is planning to start uh, with the um, national uh, population register. Again, the uh, process is, they are saying that there are news that they may start from the July or August. So they want to basically control the whole voices of dissent that uh, when they start again, there should be no voices uh, left to raise this uh, thing. Thank you so much, Pasha, for talking to us. Thanks. In our next segment, we bring you an interview with Brazilian social leader, Jesse Diani. A lot of comparisons have been made between how India and Brazil have been handling the COVID-19 crisis, not the least due to the ideological similarities between PM Modi and Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro. Brazil now has reported over 1.14 million cases and over 52,500 deaths. On Tuesday, the country reported close to 40,000 cases in the preceding 24 hours and along with the US, is among the biggest contributors to the global case count. Jesse Diane talks about the context in which the pandemic is raging in Brazil. Então, em todo o mundo, o Brasil fica atrás apenas dos Estados Unidos em números absolutos de casos e mortes. Como o Brasil chegou a esse ponto? É, como tem sido a administração da crise do coronavírus. Sim. É, então, a situação do Brasil, ela é extremamente grave, e isso acaba sendo expressada através do número de mortes altíssimo, né? Hoje a gente alcançou quase 47 mil mortes já aqui no Brasil, porque, em primeiro lugar, o presidente do país, que é a maior autoridade política, reagiu de forma negacionista em relação à doença, né? ou seja, ele, do ponto de vista anti-ciência, anti-razão, ele nega a gravidade é, dessa epidemia, de uma pandemia que é, está cometendo o mundo inteiro, né? e que todos os chefes de Estado estão tomando medidas para conter a contaminação e para buscar cura, para buscar com que um mínimo de pessoas nos seus países é, sejam contaminados e mortas, né, por conta desse coronavírus. Então, 
todos os países fizeram diversas medidas e ajustes mesmo, do ponto de vista da saúde, para lidar com a crise sanitária. E aqui no Brasil, em primeiro lugar, o presidente nega a doença, né? então ele chamou de gripezinha, falou que não era tudo isso, né? que era uma, uma gripe qualquer, é, e negou o impacto grave é, na saúde do nosso país. Então, esse é um primeiro elemento, porque além dele não tomar medidas, porque ele, ele reage de forma negacionista, ele também passa uma mensagem à população, que a boa parte da população enxerga o presidente como uma autoridade que sabe o que está dizendo. Então, quando o presidente diz, vão às ruas, trabalhem, mantenham suas vidas normalmente, parte da população acredita e parte da população menospreza, de fato, é, a gravidade da doença. Então, esse é um primeiro elemento. O segundo é que, de, em, como consequência dessa posição negacionista, ele também não tomou as medidas necessárias para que a gente pudesse conter a contaminação. Então, o presidente, ele nega todas as medidas que a OMS está dando para todo o mundo, né, então as medidas de isolamento social como a única forma, até hoje, né, comprovadamente, que consegue conter o avanço do coronavírus, né, ainda não se desenvolveu vacina, remédios, então a única forma que os médicos dizem que é possível conter é, as mortes é com isolamento social, e ele nega o isolamento social e, em consequência, todas as medidas necessárias, né, porque o que é que seria preciso no Brasil? Primeiro, desenvolver mais leitos para conseguir abarcar as pessoas que estão sendo contaminadas no nosso Sistema Único de Saúde. É, segundo, o Estado precisaria assumir os leitos dos, das, dos hospitais privados, que ainda hoje no Brasil isso não aconteceu. Isso aconteceu em várias partes do mundo, para que a gente não tenha que escolher entre quem vai morrer e quem vai viver por conta da sua condição social, financeira. Né? É, terceiro elemento também, os testes. O número de testagens no Brasil é baixíssimo. E o fato da gente não ter muitos testes faz com que a gente não tenha uma previsão de quando que essa curva vai ser achatada, de quando que chegou o pico, de quantas pessoas estão contaminadas, e, consequentemente, sem essa previsão, você não consegue ter uma estratégia de contenção da doença, né? É, e a gente falta tudo, assim, né? Falta material, o EPI, para o pessoal da saúde que trabalha em hospitais, então, é uma situação de extrema calamidade é, e de crise sanitária profunda, em decorrência da postura negacionista e também da falta de, de medidas necessárias para garantir isolamento social. Então, aqui no Brasil, a oposição é, ao governo no Congresso Nacional, desde o início da pandemia, fez diversas brigas, né, para conseguir é, aprovar medidas que garantissem isolamento social, uma delas foi a renda emergencial. A oposição propôs um salário mínimo, o governo estava propondo 200 reais, que não dá para, assim, para nada aqui no Brasil. E, é, depois dessa disputa, acabou conquistando os 600 reais, 600 a 1.200, que foi aprovado, mas até hoje, milhões de brasileiros não conseguem acessar esse recurso devido à burocracia do governo. Né? Então, tudo isso faz com que as pessoas continuem indo às ruas para trabalhar, porque elas precisam sobreviver. Né? Então, o governo também jogou com esse discurso de é, se a gente isola, garanta isolamento social, se vocês ficam em casa, vocês vão ficar sem comida, vocês vão ficar sem emprego, a economia vai parar. Então, ele colocou a população entre a fome e o coronavírus. Mas se você fica em casa e não trabalha, ou seja, é, não se expõe ao risco do coronavírus, você passa fome. Então, ele colocou a situação, a população entre a morte pela doença ou a morte pela ausência de condição de sobreviver, né? That's all we have in this episode of Let's Talk. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from across the country. Until then, keep watching News Click.